Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Science at Melbourne event. My name is Professor Moira O'Brien. I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Faculty of Science. So I will begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we are on today. They are the Wurundjeri people. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of everyone joining us online around Australia and overseas. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are Australia's first scientists with deep and enduring knowledge of the lands, waters and skies. I also pay my, res I pay my respects to elders past and present and I welcome all First Nations people joining us here today. Thank you. Science at Melbourne is an annual calendar of events that shares our faculty's knowledge and scientific curiosity, engages audiences in current research and empowers the community to ask questions and take action for a better world. This is the fourth and final event for the 2023 series and we hope you've enjoyed the lectures and that you will continue to join us next year. Please note that this event is being recorded and the video will be available on the Faculty of Science website very soon. We will also email the link to everyone who has registered for the event. Tonight we're here to talk about the future of food. In a wealthy country like Australia, it's easy to take food security for granted. But climate change and other environmental, political and economic trends could make food security an issue for everyone on Earth. The release of the federal government's intergenerational report in August identified the impact of climate change and net zero transformation on food security as one of the challenges that will shape Australia over the next 40 years. Our panel will discuss this emerging global issue, it, its root causes and the research being done here and overseas to protect and improve our food security. Tonight we are lucky to have panels consisting of three excellent academics. They are Dr Rachel Carey from our School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Sciences, Dr Seneca Randadira, also from our School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Sciences, Professor Tom Compass, who sits across two schools, that being Biosciences and the School of Ecosystem and uh, Eco the School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Sciences. <laughs> And we are also delighted to have Professor Margie Mayfield with us, who will, be this, who will be moderate the discussion tonight. Margie is the head of the School of Biosciences. She is also a plant community ecologist, interested in how changes to the environment impact plant and insect community structure and function. After completing her PhD at Stanford University on the countryside biogeography of plants and agricultural landscapes in Costa Rica, Margie has continued to focus on mechanisms underlying patterns of plant diversity. Margie works, Margie's work ranges from largely theoretical um, to very applied questions about how biological diversity is maintained in general and in response to local to large-scale environmental challenges resulting from climate change, invasive species, urbanisation, agricultural intensification and, on a more positive note, restoration. Margie has worked with government and industry partners on a number of forest restoration experiments. She hopes to continue advancing theoretical ecology through the detailed study of the natural world and provide the knowledge needed to develop effective restoration and conservation strategies for the future. We are very grateful to have Margie here to moderate this important discussion about the future of food. Thank you again for joining us and with pleasure I hand over to Margie. Thank you, Moira, and thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I also just want to welcome everybody who's here with us today, uh, both in person and online. Uh, thank you for joining us. So I'm really looking forward to leading this interesting discussion tonight on the very important topic of food security and what it means for us both globally and locally, even to the household level here in Melbourne. 
So for food security, as, Mel, as Moira uh, pointed to, is a really pressing and complex issue. It is estimated that one in seven people worldwide are currently chronically hungry, and an estimated 1.36 billion people more are going to face severe food insecurity by 2050. So clearly, it's an extremely pressing question or problem for the world um, of today. Here in Australia, food insecurity may seem like more of a distant problem facing other countries, but as our panelists are going to discuss tonight, it is a really complex multi-factor issue, and it definitely is impacting us now, although I'm going to ask them what they think about that in a minute. Um, and it's going to be increasingly impacting us for a variety of reasons. So as Moira noted in her introduction, the federal government has already um, identified food security in their new intergenerational report as one of the key challenges that will be facing Australia over the next 40 years. But food security is already impacting us today. For instance, did you know that um, the Australian economy loses $1.36 billion a year through food waste, over 50% of that food waste through household, individual households? Meanwhile, climate change has already reduced the amount of food that's available globally, with wheat, a major crop here in Australia, known to be heavily impacted by changes in the climate. It's estimated that individual crops of, of wheat can have reductions from 6 to 65 percent with increases in climate warming. So we're expecting major declines in the, as we reach that sort of four degree increase in temperature that we're expecting. And Australian wheat is certainly not immune to these, to these negative impacts. Likewise, and closer to home, did you know that between 13 and 33 percent of Australians already can't afford food or are finding it hard to find enough food um, with the income that they have. And this is even higher when we look at particular groups such as single parent households, young people, indigenous communities, and culturally diverse immigrant groups. So it is a complex issue and there's a lot of factors that contribute to food security. And I'm delighted tonight to be able to introduce three experts who are going to tell you about the different ways that they study and work on food security. And I think um, when the way we're going to run this session is I'm going to start with a series of questions that I'll, I'll point to the, to the speakers. And then we'll open it up for questions in the live audience as well as online. So we have people monitoring online. So those of you online, please make sure to write down your questions so that we can ask them to the panel when we get to the second part of this evening's event. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel members. So first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rachel Carey. Uh, Rachel in, uh, investigates the resilience and sustainability of city food systems, including here in Melbourne. She is interested in how urban sprawl, climate change, pandemics, population growth, and declining supplies of natural resources can contribute to food insecurity. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Seneca Renadira, who studies food processing and food preservation and is interested in how these factors contribute to food security. I, he will help us understand how and why we might be, th be throwing out more food than we need to be. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Compass, who is a chief investigator at the Center of Excellence for risk, Biosecurity Risk Analysis. He investigates biosecurity and environmental economics and will help us understand the global environmental drivers of food security, insecurity. So with that, I'd like to start by asking each panel in turn um, to tell us what food security means to them and to give us a little introduction about their particular um, research focus in this area. So Rachel, let's start with you. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. Um, so for me, food security is fundamentally about ensuring that everybody has access to enough nutritious food and that that food is produced in a way that doesn't damage the environment so that future generations are also able to meet their food needs from the natural resources that are around us as well and ensuring that people are able to access food in a dignified way that they have control over. Um, and that also means that people are able to access food that is culturally appropriate for them and that meets their own personal food needs as well. So if we think about food security that way, there's a couple of different aspects to food security. There's the availability of food in the food supply, and then there is whether or not people are actually able to access the food that is in the food supply. And I'm sure we'll come on to talking about some of the reasons why many people currently are not able to do that. 
Um, and so for me, the area that I work in, I work very much on promoting sustainable, resilient, healthy and equitable food systems. I'm a senior lecturer in food systems, so I look right across the whole food supply chain, looking at everything that happens to get our food to us, from the farm to the fork. And I focus particularly on working with policymakers. So I work in a very collaborative way um, with policymakers and with stakeholders right throughout the food system to look at the pressures that are facing us, to provide evidence to support policymakers in taking decisions, um, to ensure that we do have a, a sustainable, equitable and healthy food system. And I work collaboratively with them to produce um, policy roadmaps, essentially, and visions for what the future of the food system might look like. Thank you. So, Sadako, what do you think? Do you, do you agree with that definition of food security, or would you add? Or Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, um, I think I definitely totally agree with you, Rachel. Um, as we all know, you know, world, world population is 8 billion as of now, and it's going to be 9.8 billion by 2050. So food production, food processing is an enormous burden, um, and it's, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a challenge. So we need to come to um, food production in Australia and food security in Australia. Australia is one of the most food secured countries. But there's another element when it comes to food safety, uh, food security. That's the quality and safe, nutritious food product. That's the area which I am mostly um, interested in. If you guys um, remember what has happened in last few weeks um, here in Australia, uh, there were a few, um, in terms of food safety, I mean, there were a few incidences um, on um, outbreaks on um, Salmonella and Listeria um, all around Australia. Uh, there were some incidences um, like uh, poisonous mushrooms, again, um, with the you know, um, uh, food safety uh, related issues, uh, there were some incidences. For the first time, I think we heard these uh, brain-eating bugs, um, worms, uh, you know, um, said to be or uh, reported to be associated with um, consumption of uh, fresh vertical greens. Again, food safety issues. Um, and there was, a, there was an incident, um, one of the wedding guests was you know, food poisons, and everyone had to go to hospital and treated. So again, yes, availability and affordability is important factors, but it need to be safe quality um, and also nutritious food. Um, what we need to perform our, you know, day-to-day -day activities, perform well. So I think that's also a very um, important element in food security. So Great. I work... Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, I work as a um, senior lecturer in food processing and uh, preservation. Um, I'm mostly interested in how we can utilize um, some of the food waste, because food waste is, again, a, a big contributor uh, for the food um, security issues, um, and um, how we can um, sort of uh, recover nutritious uh, bioactive compounds from these materials and utilize them um, into um, uh, 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 value-added products to minimize the food security issues. Wonderful, thank you. So Tom, how about you? <laughs> so I very much appreciate the definitions that my colleagues have been using for food security. Mine's a little bit more basic. Um, for a bit of context, the short bio for me is that uh, I'm an applied mathematician <laughs> an applied mathematician and economist who loves large dimensional computational models for biosecurity and climate change, all of which is normally a conversation stopper, <laughs> but not today, I hope not today. Um, most of my recent work has been looking at the economic impacts, the damages that come from global warming to the agricultural industry. And indeed, some of those estimates for Australia were used in the intergovernmental uh, uh, report or intergenerational government report that was just launched. So Melbourne Uni had a big impact in terms of that report. Um, and also looking at sort of biosecurity events. Varroa, varroa recently is a good example, uh, a disease that uh, affects uh, honeybees, and it's causing quite a bit of trouble. 
So I'm gonna concentrate mostly on those aspects, so losses in agricultural productivity from invasive pests and diseases, mm -hmm. and also from global warming, in particular global warming. My measure of food security or insecurity in that context is relatively simple. It's just minimum calorie intake per unit of population. I look at it across countries, because it's a big global model, of course, including Australia, uh, but I don't look at it subnationally, and that's, that's the material my colleagues really pick up on. They look at the distribution subnationally in terms of food and who's better off and who's not in Australia. Wonderful. Thank you. So as you can see, we have quite a diverse uh, panel who's going to provide us a lot of different uh, perspectives on this important issue. So my next question is for you, Rachel. Um, it's a bit of a loaded question. Do you think that Australia has a serious food security problem? And if not, do you think it will soon? Okay, <laughs> so that's, that's a big question for us to unpack. Um, I'm going to start by saying that I think that we have a narrative in Australia that we are a, a food secure country. And I think that we have that narrative because we produce and export a lot of food, and that's true. We do produce and export a lot of food. But if we unpack that a bit, we find that we produce and export a lot of some types of foods. And those types of foods, of course, are um, livestock products, especially so um, meats, dairy, grains, and some other foods too. But we, you know, we particularly export those types of foods. There are some types of foods that we don't produce as much of, and they're things like fruits and vegetables particularly. And so if, for instance, we were all to eat the amount of vegetables that the dietary guidelines tell us to, which unfortunately most of us don't, but if we were to do that, then in fact we wouldn't be growing enough vegetables um, nationally to actually support that. We don't have a surplus of, of vegetables, and in fact many vegetables grow around the fringes of cities, and they're the place, of course, where we're losing farmland to new housing developments that are going up as well. So I would say actually in terms of the availability of food, then yes, we're really quite, quite self-sufficient as a country in the food that we produce, but um, you know, we have to unpack that a bit. There were certainly areas where we're not producing as much food as we could. But that's one element of it. The second element, of course, is that is access to food. So food security is about much more than how much food we're producing. It's about people's access to the food that's available in the food supply. And Margie's already talked about those um, figures in terms of um, at the moment, on the latest figures, it looks like somewhere between 13 and up to 33% of Australians are either moderately to severely food insecure. That's a wide range because we're not really effectively monitoring at the moment at a national level um, what, what, those, what those rates are. But that's a lot of people. So that, that at, at a minimum estimate, that's at least 3 million people. And if we go to the higher figure, that's a lot more people than that, that are either running out of food and not able to afford to buy more, or who are taking measures to make sure that they don't run out of food. And so on that basis, I would say, yes, absolutely. You know, we do definitely have a problem. Wonderful, thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up? What do you think are some of the sort of local factors that are impacting that food insecurity, that access? insecurity that we're seeing in the country right now? Yeah, so we've got local and global factors that are affecting us at the moment. So even if we're buying food in Melbourne, we probably people have noticed that food prices have been rising and that's been happening for a while. That happened through the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, and it's continuing to happen. And there are a number of factors for that that primarily relate to different shocks and stresses that are affecting food systems globally and locally. And so, of course, globally, we have conflict um, we have Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has led to rising food prices for a whole range of different reasons. Um, and then, of course, we have climate-related shocks as well that have been affecting us locally. So um, shocks such as fires um, back to 2019, 2020. More recently, of course, the opposite problem, floods. Um, but all of these things are impacting the price of food. And then in addition to that, of course, we have a cost of living crisis generally. So you know, we have for people um, the cost of other basics in life also going up and then people having to make very difficult choices. Um, and often food is something that people tend to cut back on when they're facing other cost of living pressures. No, wonderful, thank you. So Seneca, moving on to you, I think um, you have some very different and interesting perspectives on how food processing 
And the way that food is sort of dealt with commercially and the waste of the food that we produce and how that's impacting some of this local insecurity that we're facing now and are likely to have worse problems in, in the, up for in the future. So could you tell us a little bit about how that sort of commercial, commercial processing and waste contributes to food insecurity? Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. It's uh, food processing is, you know, a bit of a controversial um, topic. Sometimes people think, you know, processed food, food processing, not good for us and all this. But there are so many benefits on food processing. In terms of food security, the most benefit that we are getting food processing is um, extension of shelf life. I can give you a very um, small example. Um, fresh milk before pasteurization, we can keep them for three hours, four hours without, uh, without chilling or refrigeration. But, you know, our recommendation is still is, you know, refrigerate them as soon as possible. But if you pasteurize them and chill, you can keep them for one week, perhaps, you know, 10 days. Um, but how about if you produce something like yogurt out of that milk? You will be able to keep them for six weeks under refrigerated conditions. Likewise, you know, these, these um, processing techniques and preservation techniques is really important and contribute largely um, into um, food um, security in, in current day. Um, same time, expert says, you know, we produce sufficient and enough food to feed the people in the world. They say it's, even in 2050, it's not going to be a problem. Even though we waste one third of what we produced, we can still feed. But the problem is the distribution again, minimizing the waste, new preservation techniques, new processing techniques that um, we need to extend the shelf life of these products, which, which also help with the distribution. Mm -hmm. We can provide them for, you know, um, keep them for a longer time. And um, even in Australia, our distribution channels, are, you know, it takes so much time sometimes to take food from one corner to the other. So we need these um, techniques and, and, uh, and, and knowledge, especially um, as well, in terms of, you know, contribute to the, ensure the food security in this country. And what about the waste side of things? You, you talk a bit about how much food we waste and that it would be nice to be able to use that waste for something. What sort of technologies do you sort of explore in terms of sort of harnessing that waste in a more productive fashion? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do have some statistics <laughs> I'm going to read out. I um, thought you might. <laughs> as you mentioned, you know, um, um, Australia household waste um, 2.5 million tons of food each year. And this is about four kilograms per household per week. We all are responsible for this, okay? Um, then the Australian economy lost um, $36.6 billion per year uh, due to the food waste, and half of that, again, comes from the household. Um, the Australian household spend um, around 2,500 per year on food that is wasted. Everyone is responsible in this, okay? We need to understand the problem and the scale of the problem and try to minimize the waste. So minimizing waste, um, I think we can address in two ways. One is in the industry or the commercial um, scale. Another good example is um, when we talk about the food waste is byproduct of the food. Byproduct that we get as a result of food processing. Um, we all love cheese, <laughs> but the cheese industry produces 1.65 million tons of liquid whey every year. Um, and the apple juice industry produces 30,000 tons of apple pumice um, annually. How we can utilize these products um, to um, recover the bioactives or produce um, new products that can be utilized um, in, our, in our system. These are the things I think um, the challenges and um, these are the things I think we need to think about when it comes to 
food security and food processing and waste minimizing. Wonderful. Thanks. Can I add to that? Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps and just talk a bit about um, why it is that we waste food as well. And Seneca's talked there about the need to, I guess, reuse that waste in different ways. And like, we, so we think about that as being recycling that waste. And sometimes we talk about the idea of building what we call a circular food economy. And that's the idea of kind of taking those waste products and getting extra value out of them. But then, of course, um, we also need to think about just preventing that food waste from happening in the first place. Um, because, of course, all the food that's wasted is, is a waste of all those natural resources that went into producing the food, all of which are in short supply, as well as the greenhouse gas emissions, of course, that if that food ends up in landfill. But what some of the evidence is telling us about why we waste food, Seneca's actually absolutely right. We all, well, first, it tells us that we all waste far more food than we think that we do. People will report wasting much less food than they actually do if you go through the rubbish bins to see what's actually in there. Um, but some of the reasons why it, some of the reasons um, why we waste, according to the research evidence at the moment, is, for instance, it's about our household practices and, and, and also social norms. So there's basic things that we're all doing at home, <clears throat> which are to do with whether or not we plan our food, plan our meals, plan our shopping lists, actually look in the fridge and the freezer, etc., before you know before we go out to shop. Don't but shop also, hungry. Well, absolutely. Don't shop hungry and don't shop without a list. Yeah, but also it's actually a bit more complicated than that because the evidence also suggests that it's actually our social norms, the unwritten social rules about how we all behave around food. And just to give an example of one we're probably all quite familiar with, if people are coming around to your home for a meal, you're kind of likely to over-cater. So why do we over-cater? Do we over-cater because we don't know how much food to put on? Probably not. We're over-catering because we know that we have to be a good host, right? We have to be a generous host. We have to, you know, provide lots of more than enough food in a way. So tackling food waste is probably also about us actually talking to each other about that in terms of changing those social norms, having conversations with each other when people kind of come around to our homes and perhaps we don't cook as much as we normally do and we actually talk about that. Yeah. So as you said before, I guess it's really quite complex. Yes. Well, I think um, maybe we'll move on to Tom and maybe think we've talked a lot about the local issues of food security, but I'd like to hear a little bit about your thoughts on or information about climate change and how it's impacting food security. So, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about the general problems that climate change is causing for food security, but also the impacts it's having on us here locally in Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, happy to do that. Thank you. Um, I couldn't help myself. I, I brought three slides. <laughs> I didn't bring a card, but I brought slides, so it's okay. So if we can, the three slides, the first slide shows the impact of heat stress in a climate and trade model globally for 140 countries and 60 different commodity groups, most of which are agriculture. And indeed, the heat stress damage function in these models affects agricultural productivity and labor productivity. You know, when it's really hot, it's hard to work, and it's especially hard to work when you're outside in agriculture. The second slide will look at losses in agricultural productivity by degrees going forward. That's the one that was used by Treasury in the intergovernmental uh, report, intergenerational report. Um, and the third slide will look at the impact of not only heat stress, but water stress on agricultural production. I'm a little skeptical about production in 2050 from those food experts saying there's plenty to eat. Well, maybe, but it maybe not, given global warming. And indeed, it may, in fact, you're right, largely a dis distributional problem. Americans may have to eat less so others can eat more, and I'm, I'm one of them. So, so um, if we could just go back to another slide. Let's just look at the first slide. This is the impact of just heat stress alone in terms of losses in agricultural, agricultural and labor productivity by country in this integrated climate and trade model. So we're looking at trade patterns as well as the effect of climate. And you can see it's a, it's a fairly heterogeneous pattern and it affects mostly South, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, some parts of, of uh, Latin America as well, especially Central America. Um, the resolution's not quite right because America and Australia should be slightly pink. And in fact, more red here means more losses. 
So if it's redder, it means a larger fall in national income as a result of heat stress alone. So no sea level rise, no storm surge, no loss in biodiversity, no localized floods and fires, just heat stress. And you can see that GDP in this context ranges from about 1%, the losses range from about 1% to 28%. 28% is quite devastating. And indeed, the dollar amounts ramp up to 2100 quite, quite uh, significantly, roughly about uh, 610 trillion USD, which if you divide by 80 is about 7 trillion a year, which is basically a COVID-sized shock every year for the next 80 years. Of course, it's backloaded because it's climate change, but these effects are starting to happen now. So, yeah, quite troubling. Next slide. In fact, that map was, it appears in Nature Climate Change, a professional journal. You can, you can go and have a look and see what it, what it argues. These are the, these are the results um, for changes in agricultural productivity for the main cropping yields, right? So maize, soybean, wheat, these sorts of yields. And you can see rice is here as well. You can see as temperatures ramp up, yields fall quite considerably. That's why I'm worried about 2050, right? Be if yields fall considerably, it would, could mean a problem with food security indeed. Indeed, if you take the extreme case of four degrees, you can see that wheat falls on average, this is a grid model, global, very large dimensional, uh, on average by about 32%. It's a major loss in yield. And the extremes are in the brackets. So some countries, only a minus 6% loss at yield for wheat at three degrees, or four degrees rather. One country, a minus 65% loss in yield. So you're right, in some sense it may be just distributional. Some countries will have much, a much worse problem than other countries. It depends upon the temperature range. It depends upon how much we, we add the carbon to the atmosphere. For Australia, the numbers aren't quite as dramatic, but I'll show you a graphic in a minute that sort of underlies that point. So first slide, heat stress. Second slide, heat stress and precipitation changes. Third slide, heat stress and water stress. Third slide. And then I'll stop, Margie. So by water stress here, I mean losses in water as a result of what's called green water. Uh, sorry, blue water. Blue water is losses in water for, for irrigation. And in many parts of the world, you know, agriculture is highly irrigated. Not so much in Australia, but it still is significant, especially for the really high profile, high valued cash crops. Um, you can see what happens to productivity in the panel on your left in terms of losses in agricultural productivity by country. So again, now Australia doesn't look as good as in the previous maps, right? The loss in productivity is roughly about 15% potentially, although there's a range here. So that's, that's significant. That's quite a bit. Uh, in some countries, it's, it's much more. It's up to 22% for places like India and China, and uh, to some extent, Canada gets, uh, gets clobbered as well. So it varies across the country, across the globe, as you would expect. There's a lot of heterogeneity here. But just looking at heat and water stress, forget about fires and local floods, you get rather dramatic falls in productivity. And that, that for me, is pretty alarming. Um, and that's in 2050, indeed. You take it out to 2100, and these numbers just explode, as you would expect. So it's a good question. You know, is, is there enough food available in 2050, in 2100? Is it just a distributional problem? Um, is it a problem of nutrition? Good questions. The last little graphic shows the number of people under <coughs> severe food insecurity by country, and indeed Africa especially gets pounded. Depending upon the extent of global warming, it can be anywhere from half a billion to 1.36 billion people, additional to current measures of global insecurity that will face starvation. Again, using a very minimal 1,000 calorie per day measure of food security. So my last point, and I, I will stop. My last point is that all of this implies dramatic changes in trade patterns. I mean, some of this may benefit Australia. Other countries are having trouble with, uh, with food and food production. So Australians may be able to export more. OK, 
Okay, and that may happen. Yeah. It happens with LNG, with natural gas at the moment. We export a lot of natural gas, uh, so that domestically we often have a shortage, right? We're a bit insecure in natural gas. There's two-tiered pricing here, but these things will matter, right? Unless we're going to stop exports, like India has recently done on rice, you know, you may have a food security problem in Australia because things are going overseas to account for these major losses. That said, yeah, we're a net importer. You talked about cheese and yogurt. I love cheese and yogurt. We're a net importer of milk in this country. Net. Incredible to me, given Gippsland's just down the road. So these changes globally will impact our imports as well. Thanks, Margie. Okay. I'm just wondering, I, I think the, um, you know, the sort of the balancing between the different levels of production and the falls we're expected to see on that, that issue of transport and, and uh, import and export of different goods. Could you talk a little bit about how that's likely to impact a place like Melbourne, which you know we've already talked with Rachel about how the cost of living, the cost of food is already very expensive here. We don't produce all the, the types of food that we're accustomed to. What sorts of changes do you think are likely to happen at a very local le mm. level, given the dynamics of our partic particular food production system well, I think, in Australia? I think the single major change is that the price of food will increase, in some cases quite dramatically. Okay. Um, if we have to import more food, or even if we're exporting more food and having less available domestically, prices will rise. Right. Right, and, and that's just going to happen. Yep. So it will squeeze budgets quite a bit, and when you combine it with increases in, in the reserve bank rate, you really get squeezed, right? right. So that's basically it. The price yep. will change. The, yep. Although there may be an availability problem, again, much like my LNG, natural gas sort of scenario, right? Because you'll be able to sell more overseas, mm -hmm. be less available domestically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I think we have about five minutes before I'm going to turn it over to the audience. But just to, to sort of end this part of the evening, I'd like to ask you each if you could choose one thing that you could change to reduce the amount of food insecurity that we see today. Maybe, Tom, something realistic. <laughs> um, what would it be? <laughs> Rachel. Rachel. Um, I'm a policy person and I'm interested in, I guess, the kind of big levers that we can pull that will really make a difference. So for me, the best thing we could do in Australia would be to have somebody within government who is accountable and responsible for whether people actually have enough food and we don't have that at the moment. We don't have any kind of gov government responsibility um, for that. So I would say, if I could have one thing, I would appoint a minister for food. Wonderful. And Seneca? Um, for me, it's the education. Um, we talk about these statistics. We bring, you know, all this um, information either here <laughs> or here. Um, uh, but um, the public, they don't understand. That's the problem. We need to um, uh, educate the people. We need to go to them and tell this is the problem. I think um, in here, um, science communication is really, really important. We need to tell them in a sort of a bite-sized chunks in, a, in an understandable way. Um, I was watching one of the videos um, recently, and they were talking about um, how um, we can minimize the food waste to the general public, and um, they said, you know, wait, if you throw um, one hamburger out, you're wasting the water that utilized for the production of that hamburger, which is equivalent to fill 15 bath tanks, um, the, the, the baths, yeah. And um, that's a powerful message. You know, people can understand, even I was shocked. It is, you know, the energy, uh, the feed, and uh, everything, the labor, the, the, the capital we put to production of these things, then the people would understand. Mm -hmm. Then people would think about that, and they will try to minimize the waste, which can be a big contributor uh, for the food security. Wonderful. Tom? Indeed, so indeed, 60% of all water use in Australia is for agriculture. It takes a lot of water to produce food. Uh, my one thing, I'm, I, I want to say it, is to stop, well, no new coal in and gas mines, done. 
Okay? But having said that, anyway. I thought you were going to say stop climate change. That's what I was well, trying to prevent. That's, you. That's, sort of, <laughs> that's more or less it, is it? Yeah. No new coal, please. Um, coal is especially bad. Yeah. Um, but we, we really need to ramp up, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but we, we need to ramp up our biosecurity footprint. Mm -hmm. Because invasive pests and diseases are moving dramatically across the globe, and most of them are moving south towards Australia, right? We, we had a, a case of Japanese encephalitis in Victoria. It's a tropical pest. My God, how did that happen? Well, things are getting warmer. Um, if, if we have a foot and mouth disease incursion or lumpy skin dis disease incursion, boom, 20 to $60 billion gone. Um, oriental fruit fly? you lose about two-thirds of your avocado industry, and I, I love avocados. So the department in Canberra and local government, and local state governments are doing a lot, but we underinvest in that. I mean, Severus come up with a measure that says if we invest a dollar in biosecurity, we get a $30 return. So we need to invest more, make sure that we protect ourselves and agriculture from these invasive pests and diseases. That's, that's, that's I think, paramount for me. Great. Three very different answers, that's good. All right, so to, we are now to the part of the evening where I'm gonna turn things over to all of you. Um, so we have Joe who is getting online questions and Rebecca has a microphone, she's going to mill around. Um, I think just to give people in the room a little bit of time to feel comfortable asking a question, we might start with a question from Joe um, uh, from online. Yeah, definitely. We've had a few questions. A great one perhaps for Seneca is, what is the biggest challenge in upcycling food waste from food byproducts? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think it's the, 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 the main challenge that we are facing at the moment is we don't have skillful um, personnel working in, in, the, in the industry. We do have great people, but the problem is much bigger. So we need to um, train people more. Um, and also, I think, um, investing more um, on research, um, utilization of um, food waste, and bring them into mainstream as a valuable product. Um, those could be um, some of the major challenges, I think. I think the gentleman, yep, in the blue shirt. Uh, thank you. Uh, really interesting, thank you. Um, so I'd like to have my cake and eat it too, except uh, my cake's biodiversity. Um, we've talked about a number of crises, the climate crisis, the um, food crisis, the water crisis, um, and the biodiversity crisis. The, given that the Australia has signed on to the global biodiversity framework and has committed to 30% of our land being in protected areas by 2030, and 30% additionally being restored, that's going to put a lot of pressure on agricultural systems because most of the places we need to protect to adequately protect Australia's mega diversity is in agricultural systems that have been cleared. So my question to you is, how are we going to do those two things? How are we going to meet the needs of our country through biodiversity, address the climate crisis, and maintain or enhance our food security. I think it can be done. Um, I'm interested in your views on that. All right, maybe we start with Tom. Uh, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, it'll take a while to sort of unpack that. Uh, but, but you're quite right. I mean, there is a case now for reforestation given the plan that you just outlined. And in that, that indeed may impact agricultural land, I think quite significantly may enhance biodiversity. But the funny thing for me is in many of these climate change models I work on, just planting more trees doesn't necessarily solve the problem. It depends upon the type of tree, where the tree is located, and how diverse the forest is. So just planting a bunch of pines isn't going to do it. This isn't going to help, and it certainly doesn't help biodiversity. But, but and there is hope, right? You can do things in a better way. You can restore land. You can try and get better bio, biosecurity in place, which also impacts biodiversity member, measures tremendously. I think one of the main threats to biodiversity is invasive pests and diseases. Animals, toads, turtles, <laughs> it's just they're, they're nasty. Uh, they take away a lot of the local sort of uh, flora and fauna. 
and a lot of the uh, you know, local animals. So again, I'm back to biosecurity. I'm going to beat that drum, right? You need that as part of the solution. Rachel, or do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, it's a very, very big question. And I think there's multiple things that we're going to need to do. There isn't going to be one kind of easy answer to this. So you talked about biodiversity and land. And um, you know, the food system is exceeding multiple what we call planetary boundaries these days. So basically, it, you know, land, how much water we're using, greenhouse gas emissions that we're producing, um, other boundaries in relation to nutrients that are important for producing food as well. And if we think about what we can do about that, then <clears throat> we've got a few options. We can change the way that we produce food. We can change the way that we consume food. And we can reduce our food waste, as Seneca's been saying already. I, I think the evidence is fairly clear that we have to do all of those things, that just doing one of those things is not going to be enough. And it, it isn't going to be sufficient to keep global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees. So firstly, we need to do all of those things. And then in terms of <clears throat> how we produce um, food and thinking about, um, thinking about how we use land and how, how, how we conserve biodiversity, then I think, again, there's going to be multiple approaches to doing that. And for me, diverse approaches make sense in, in, from the point of view of having more resilient food systems. We need food systems that are resilient to shocks and stresses. And for me, resilience means that you look for a, a variety of different approaches rather than betting on one. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, as it were. And so I guess I'd like to see you know, research into a whole range of different approaches to producing food, including regenerative and agroecological approaches, as well as higher tech approaches. Um, I don't think there's one answer to it. And I think we need to be really, at this point, given the challenges that we face that have been outlined, we need to be working on all possible solutions. Right. Maybe we'll go online and then I'll come back. Um, yep. Thanks, Margie. Someone's asked, can any speakers give an example on research or technology that has been done to reduce food waste in Australia or globally? Seneca, this one's clearly yours. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are many, actually. Um, uh, food valorisation, um, utilisation of byproduct into, um, you know, mainstream food products, um, for example, uh, apple pomace might be um, a very good um, fiber source. Um, or um, you can, you can um, use, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this um, liquid way to recover some of the bioactive compounds. Um, and, and also um, um, some research into, you know, um, sustainable packaging, things like that is also becoming very um, uh, sort of prominent um, using food by byproduct as well. Uh, so there are various um, level of solutions um, that we can, we can provide to utilize these food waste um, and bring them into very valuable products at this stage. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for the discussion. Um, I'm wondering about, do you think there's any pressure being put on food security by a relatively uneducated consumer um, pressurising food uh, production to be done in a certain way? So less herbicides, less uh, fertilisers. What impact do you think that will have on food security? Um, if I can just take... Ref phrase the question, just make sure that I understand what you're saying. So you're basically, you asking about what if we use, what if we use less intensive approaches to food production? Is that, oh, is I, that I'm, your question? I'm suggesting that maybe there's, there's a, there's a um, pressure from consumers to produce food differently, produce it more regeneratively, you use that phrase, um, you know, with less food, uh, less pesticides, less fertilisers. Um, but w do you think if that's the way we're were pushed to farm, what impact on food security do you think that will have, if any? Yeah, so I'll make a few comments on that. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, firstly, I would say that, look, honestly, the majority of consumers at the moment, price is actually the key thing for most people, and so I actually don't see a huge amount of pressure at the moment, if I'm being honest, um, to produce food in that way, because for most people, it, it's just about being able to afford enough food at the moment. 
Um, if we're looking at the questions around, say, fertilizers, I think the fact is that we do need to work out how to produce food with less fertilizers because um, you know, fertilizer production is linked to fossil fuels and it's linked to phosphate rock. And you know, both of those for um, different reasons, we either don't want to be using anymore or are gonna be in short supply. So I think basically we do need to find alternatives to that or that we just don't have a choice. And so, yeah, I think we need to be looking at multiple different approaches to the way that we're going to produce food. And I think that is going to include higher tech approaches. And I think it's going to include more ecological approaches as well. Yeah, um, I think, uh, Rachel, um, uh, absolutely. Um, but um, at the same time, there are, are some demand um, for um, such approaches as well. Uh, for example, like organic farming, uh, things like that, um, some people really need them. So for me, I think it, it is okay, we can, we can go for um, those approaches as well. But um, in terms of food security, I think we need to go for more technological advanced uh, food production. Yeah, and, so, and some of that is happening. I mean, there are a number of farms that are using more sustainable methods, uh, more organic production, but their price point is a problem. They tend to be more expensive. Um, to produce. Yeah, sorry to hog the microphone, but I guess my mind goes to the pressures being put on by the EU, and so where, you know, you can't use certain fertil uh, fertilisers or um, herbicide regimes, which actually then reduces production. Um, and so, yeah, I'm wondering <laughs> what the implication will be on food security if we're actually reducing our production mm. under those strategies. So we're not a big exporter to the EU, although that's significant. Yeah. Most of our goods go to Asia and Southeast Asia at the moment, especially animals. Um, so yeah, those things will matter over time. And in fact, pest pathways and trade patterns change dramatically. We may in fact be exporting more to the EU going forward. Exactly right. So we'll have to comply. Can I just, I mean, Contributing to that, I would think, is that, you know, like Europe is quite opposed to GMOs, but to me, GMOs are a, an extremely effective way to reduce the amount of chemicals that we use in agriculture. So do you see some of these technological advances clashing with our sort of societal values? Yeah, it's, a, it's a really good point. I mean, GMO is common in, in, in America, where we come from, you and I. But yeah, um, exactly right. So I think it's a really good technological solution. but. People have trouble with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I uh, sorry, um, I think we will definitely have to use uh, more and more those, um, you know, GM foods, advanced technologies to feed that um, 9.8 billion yeah. in yeah. 2050, for sure. Mm -hmm. If I could just add to that, perhaps it's actually also about just how we implement those technologies, because you know there are people who don't necessarily have any any philosophical opposition to you know, using high-tech approaches and using GM, but do worry about the way that it's being implemented at the moment, for instance, in some countries. Um, uh, so certainly in some parts of the world, the package of technologies that goes with that or whether or not people can save seeds, you know, for the next season and just the control that exactly. a small number of companies have. So I'd say there's, there's, there's legitimate concerns that people have about the way that, yeah. you know, GM um, technologies are sometimes being introduced in some parts of the world. Yeah. I'm back online. Yeah, question for Rachel. Firstly, they've said many thanks to the entire panel for a great discussion. Do you see a role for urban agriculture to tackle food security in Melbourne? And if so, how do you see it implemented? Um, so the short answer to that is yes. When I think about urban agriculture, I guess I mean urban and peri-urban agriculture. So I don't necessarily just mean food growing within the city boundary, but particularly the food that's growing on the fringe of Melbourne. And there is a lot of food that grows on the fringe of Melbourne. So almost half of the vegetables that are produced in the state of Victoria <clears throat> actually grow in what I would call Melbourne's food bowl. So on the fringe of the city. And so it's a really important part of food production, especially for you know, fresh, perishable um, food products. And it's really important that we keep that going as well as looking for other spaces around the city where we can produce food. And one of the reasons that that's important is because of the shocks and stresses to our food supply and because of the need now to make food production more resilient. And so it just doesn't make any sense. If it ever did, it certainly doesn't make any sense now 
to be completely dependent on distant sources of food. We've, there's many types of shocks or stresses around Melbourne, and we've done some research on that ourselves in my team, the Food Print Melbourne team, um, looking at the shocks and stresses that could affect the city's food system, everything from fire to storms to floods, and you want to have food growing close to you within the city, and that means community-based production as well as commercial production. It's not that one is ever going to, um, you know, is ever going to uh, sort of take over the other. It's just simply that it all is an important part of a resilient um, food system. So yes, I would say that urban agriculture um, is an important part of the city's food security into the future, but it is under threat. And it's particularly under threat from loss of farmland around the city fringe. And it's really important in the way that we plan the city that we introduce strong measures to protect that food production because it's really a fundamental building block in, in you know, the city's future. Food security, especially in the context of climate change. And the other key thing that I guess we've talked about before is just water security as well. So again, it's going to be difficult to keep producing food around the city unless we can secure water. And so that is really about ensuring that we um, are using much more of our wastewater to produce food. So recycled water from the city's water treatment plants and also in the future looking at the way that we use storm water as well. Yeah, so vertical farming, non-soil vertical farming is a bit of a thing in parts of Europe. Um, so I suspect we'd see more of that, but it uses a lot of what we call blue water for irrigation. No soil, it's just stacking fruits and vegetables up in a warehouse and growing them um, by irrigating uh, heavily. The cost of that's falling dramatically, so I would expect to see more of that as long as there's water available, and that is an issue. If, if I can just add to that, I mean, we certainly could be using recycled water from the cities water treatment plants to do that. So both of Melbourne's water treatment plants produce a huge amount of water that's recycled to class A standard that can be used to produce food. And we're using a very small proportion of that at the moment to produce food. Um, actually, most of the water that's treated to the grade that could produce food is actually being discharged out at sea. It's not being that's used right. for any productive purpose at all. And I think we could be making much better use of that water if we value and cost it differently, and if we include the social value of that water as well. That said, uh, both water treatment plants in Victoria are suffering from soil erosion, right? They're at the coast and they're under threat. So it's something we have to look at as well. Sorry, I know, it's a bit of a downer, right? But you know, we've got to, we've got to find a way to solve these problems. So do we have a, we have a, okay. Thanks, everyone. Well done. Very nice talk and uh, very good discussion. So I'm just thinking, like, if we can think about it repurposing rather than recycling to, um, to look at the food security in that sense, because as we already know that uh, recycling is uh, pretty hard and pretty challenging, because as just Seneca want to say, like, uh, we don't have upscaling processes in order to, to get a better quality uh, byproducts. But what about repurposing? Like, how do you think about it, Rachel? Like, if you can think about it repurposing rather than recycling, so like, how we can improve that? Seneca? Seneca. Seneca. Yeah. <laughs> because it's more toward food, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's um, a really um, important aspect. Um, I think when it comes to especially the food um, security, um, with, with food processing, I think, you know, we look at the byproducts and how, how we, can, we can utilize them uh, through various other processing methods. Okay. We need to bring more energy, more money, more um, labor just to recover them. But how about uh, if we can utilize them with sort of a minimal processing um, that can you know, um, contribute significantly, um, not only to the food security, but, but, but also other problems like you know, global warming and environmental impact, um, things like that. As you mentioned, the major problem we are having here is um, the not having the, the skillful labor for that. Yeah, right, because I'm thinking like food security is already a big challenge, but if we are moving in a different direction where we have to like spend a lot of money in order to recycle the things, so it's much better we can think about repurposing in order to like, yeah, so repurpose of many of the products. For example, if we are thinking um, 
just like you mentioned, like using some of the food waste, bring them back into the waste stream, like a food stream, it's again a big challenge. So much better to think about repurpose the food waste stream, go into the feed stream or some other streams. So it will be less challenging or more efficient in order to think about food security in one way or another way. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Wonderful talk, thank you. Thank you, Joe, we'll go back. And then Thank you. We've had lots of great questions online. Someone's asked, which countries are experiencing the biggest threats of food insecurity and what are the factors in this? Is it mostly temperature for everyone globally? So it's, it's temperature plus water stress uh, in particular. And it, Africa is, is the outlier in the sense that you can major falls in, in national income going forward. Again, up to 28%, just with limited damage functions for water stress and heat stress. Heat stress in particular was up to 28%. Leave water stress out. So those are, those are especially disturbing. Uh, but it occurs everywhere. I mean, Spain can't grow olive oil at the moment. Um, the Greece is having a problem. You know, there's, there, are, there are impacts happening all over the world. Uh, but the major, the major sort of losses, just in terms of agricultural productivity, tend to be in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, a bit in Central America as well. Yeah, I would um, just add a little bit, um, Tom. Um, I would say probably the developing countries um, are facing this problem the most, but it doesn't matter developing or developed. It can happen anywhere, as you mentioned. Um, I remember, you know, 2021 Queensland flooding affected the food pricing in here. Um, so likewise, all these um, events, environment changes um, can affect the, the food security greatly. Yeah. It, it's iconic in climate change modeling that most of the impacts, the bad impacts, are to the poorest countries. Until you bring in something like sea level rise and storm surge, then you lose Miami and Shanghai and Singapore. And, you know, those, those things start to add up, but we don't have good estimates of that yet, but that's coming. And yeah, just to add to what, um, what's already been said, I mean, certainly it is, of course, people in the global south, what's otherwise called the developing world, that certainly are experiencing absolutely the highest rates of hunger and food insecurity, and of course will be most affected by climate change in terms of yeah, the impacts that are faced. Um, having said that, of course, as we said, all, all parts of the world will be affected, including our own. I was wondering can I bring some of the threads that I've been hearing about repurposing water and, and Rachel, you mentioned um, uh, circular economy. One of the things we struggle with in the developed world is circular economy. We have very linear supply chains. We make, make, make fertilizer in China, take it to the Wimmera Mallee, we send the wheat down to Melbourne and we send the, the nitrogen off to Werribee and it five tons lands up in the bay. Um, we don't exactly, but, but we mentioned food security or insecurity in developing countries and I do some of the work in East Africa um, and we think of those as inefficient systems but they are the closest you'll ever get to circular economy um, because they actually have a mechanism for circulating the nutrients within their system and you almost say that's a, that's a you know, livestock are integral to crop production because that's where the nutrients come from and um, but when, so but we also know that as the world population grows, they're not going to afford the expensive food we produce in our linear supply chains. Um, they're going to actually have to be more self-sufficient in their own food security. Um, so are they actually better at circular economy and do we have a struggle just by the design of our supply chains in going down the route of circular economy? I think that's you, Rachel. <laughs> um, I think there's much that we can learn from those um, systems. So you mentioned the circular economy, and I think when we're thinking about circular economies, it's really important to think about circular food systems within that and the recycling of nutrients, as you've mentioned, and really trying to keep those nutrients within the system. And that, um, I guess, means that certain sorts of uses of waste products can be preferable to others because we want to capture those important nutrients like, like nitrogen and phosphorus and keep them in the system. We don't want to lose them from the system, and I think some of the agroecological systems that I think you're talking about, um, yeah, do a very good job of that, and we have much to learn from that about how to be looking at agroecological and regenerative systems that might work in an Australian context as well. Um, so you talked about countries needing to become more self-sufficient in food production, and I think that's 
kind of absolutely the case. It just makes sense in the world that we're in. If you don't want to be exposed to significant volatility in global food prices, then it just makes sense that countries are producing as much as they can themselves and that we start to think about that. Of course, we're already ahead of the game in Australia because we do produce so much food ourselves already, but we do need to think about how to do that differently and how to do that in a way that captures those nutrients. Now, how it is that we can take some of those agroecological systems and think about them in an Australian context, I don't think they necessarily just kind of translate you know, simply here, but it, they're absolutely part of the mix of approaches that I personally think we should be looking at alongside some of the higher tech approaches that we've been talking about. Tom, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I, I think that covered it. It was quite good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, let's go back online. We'll just keep flip-flopping. Yeah. Question from JJ. Is cultural understanding of food storage an issue in Australia? For example, talking about the storage of pasteurised milk earlier, JJ has said their partner is from Nepal and doesn't have the same understanding of food um, storage compared to himself. Is cultural understanding an issue in a multicultural country like Australia? Um, absolutely. Um, as I said earlier, you know, these techniques can be utilised. Some of them are really um, traditional methods. Um, Sometimes people do not know how to, how to use them at the household level. Um, with the traditional knowledge, maybe some communities, they understand how to produce cheese at home and utilize the waste as a part of their, their meal. In that case, you know, it's a zero waste. They can utilize them. Um, so the traditional knowledge and the cultural knowledge is, a, is, a, is, is playing a really big part um, in terms of uh, food security, especially towards the food processing aspects, um, I think. Anybody, do you want to say anything, Rachel? Um, I guess just to say that from the sort of cultural side, I think that um, certainly culture affects the way that people utilise food generally and absolutely food waste, and I think it can be both positive and kind of negative. I think actually in terms of just wasting less food, we, we all have a lot to learn about that. And just food storage, to be honest, the way that we store food. There's some really interesting research came out of the UK fairly recently where they actually just looked at um, the shelf life of different sorts of food products. And on the basis of that, they've actually totally changed their advice to UK supermarkets. They're telling them not to put fruit and vegetables in packaging at all, unless there's absolutely a good reason for doing that. And they've basically discovered that if we put some of those fruits and vegetables that we might normally keep out of the fridge, just put them in the fridge at less than four degrees, they're actually going to keep a lot better. Um, and even without the packaging, we just need to be putting more stuff in the fridge and we need to be keeping the fridge set lower as well. So actually, I think probably we all just have a lot to learn about that. And to be honest, there's still a lot of research going on about some of those basic things to help us understand how to waste less food. Hi, thanks for the talk so far. Really great discussion. Uh, my name is Sherry. I work at Oz Harvest. So I just wanted to quickly share that we're sort of in the... If no one really knows who Oz Harvest is, we're sort of in the middle of... Um, in between the food, um, food waste problem and the food security problem. So we, as an organisation, rescue um, food destined for landfill and repurpose that for people in need. So we're sort of in the middle of that. Um, and my question to you is, I guess the problem of food security can sound like a really big scale, large scale problem. And my question is, what's your, in your opinion, or in the research you've come across, what is the single thing like an individual who's maybe not in this um, industry or in the field of food or research, um, what's an individual's uh, biggest impact to combat food insecurity? Well, I'm going to keep working in the Faculty of Science here at the University of Melbourne <laughs> and to provide information that people can use for policy outcomes. I mean, that's, that, I see that actually as my contribution. Uh, no kidding. That's what I do. Um, oh, such a big question. The single biggest thing that we can do, um, I think, I'm probably going to say more than one thing, but I think that we can all ask a lot of questions about where our food comes from, how it was produced, 
you know, who benefited from producing that food. Um, and I think, you know, there's no doubt about it that we all probably need to change the way that we eat as well. And I guess that we can start finding out more about that. I think it would be fantastic if in the latest revision of the Australian Dietary Guidelines, which is started now and it's going to go on for the next probably a year or two that um, government came out with this time with sustainable and healthy dietary guidelines that advises us all how to eat in a sustainable and healthy way. And some countries do have those guidelines now. We tried to develop them here before, but we haven't um, been, been, been successful in the end. And I hope that we are this time. So I think there's things that we all probably can do about what we're, what we're eating, wasting less food, trying to buy food direct from farmers where we can, and that obviously is about our means to do that, right? I mean, that's not always possible. Um, yeah, it's not one thing. <laughs> I haven't got one thing, I've got multiple things. And do, I could probably do, go on yeah. for the next hour about all the things that we could do, so I'll stop. Do we want to say less beef consumption? Are we going to go there? What do you think? Yeah, I think, I mean, just to talk to the issue directly, and we probably all should, I think the evidence is, is fairly clear that for most of us here in Australia, we're probably, if we're, if we're like the average person, we are eating more meat than we need for health reasons and probably more meat than is good for the environment, and we could probably eat a bit less and be moving to, yeah, eating more plant-based foods. Um, so, but I think that... You know, the, again, interesting research came out of Europe where, um, where citizens said, but if there was a problem, wouldn't government tell us there's a problem? And if government's not telling me there's a problem, then does that mean there isn't a problem? So I really think <laughs> government just come out with some sustainable, healthy dietary guidelines and be clear there's a problem and what we should all do about it. Yeah. Um, we'll go... One more from Joe, and then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had a question for all speakers. What do you think the future of food is? Could everyone give one thing they think for the future that either needs to be changed or implemented? Uh, yeah. all of you. I've got, <laughs> more than, I've got more than one, but um, I'm going to add to the Minister for Food that I would like us to legislate the human right to food as the most important thing that we should do in this country. And what the human right to food means is that everybody has... It's a fundamental human right. Um, Australia has signed up to the various international charters um, that say that, you know, yes, we signed up to the human right to food, but we haven't legislated it, and that means that we can't hold government to account. And it essentially means that everybody has the right to um, access to enough healthy, nutritious food in a dignified manner. And a dignified manner is not needing to queue up for food parcels on a regular basis as a way to eat. We need people, people should expect to be able to have access to food in a different way. So that's my one thing. Seneca. Um, for me, in one word, exciting. What is happening in food processing is, um, is really amazing. Um, I know there are a few foodies in the audience. Uh, but the most amazing thing is now the people are interested in food. They want to know how they produce food, how we produce food. Um, and they wanted to know, you know, how we can minimize the waste and things like that. And they wanted to have the, the best uh, out of it. And um, there's so many exciting research um, going on in, in the space of food processing. So uh, I would say there's uh, much more um, new um, technologies um, is, is, is coming in, in near fu future and it will be a very exciting space. So I'm going to push the same barrel. I'm going to ask the Minister of Food to provide more funding for biosecurity. <laughs> got, to, got to happen, including for our center at Melbourne Uni. I might have. But, but look at Varroa is a good example. This is, a, this is an impacting honeybees and they're key pollinators. Um, we should have detected much earlier than we detected in New South Wales. And by the time we did detect it, too late. Can't stop it now. It'll come to Victoria. Um, just a matter of time. We need to spend more on doing biosecurity correctly. We do a lot that's good, but we need to do more for sure.
I mean, it protects both agricultural production and biodiversity. So why not? No brainer. Finally, your turn. Yeah, thank you. Um, probably, I don't know what the stats are exactly, but it feels like at least 90% of the food that comes out of a supermarket is wrapped in plastic. Um, we recycle perhaps 10% of that at best. And all the while, you know, plastic is exacerbating the, the issue of climate change significantly and it's trashing the planet. So how do we... What's the position of, of you guys on plastic and its role in, in food? Um, to me, it's, there's some real trade-offs that might need to be considered there. Seneca. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's just a very unfortunate situation. Okay, um, everything is wrapped um, in plastic, even though it is not necessary sometimes. Um, but for me, I think what I do is, um, you know, try to go for the food with less plastics. I think that's the way we need to think. Um, just change your perspectives. Try to change at least one person from your household to go for you know non-plastic materials. That's the only way that we can send the message to them. We are not buying them if you if you if you um, you know sell them in this way. I think it's just a, a changes in your perception and also more education. I think there are some good things as well. Now we don't have uh, much of these plastic straws. So it's all made up with um, um, either cardboard or um, some recyclable materials. I can add to that if you like. Just make a, a follow-up comment that um, I think a lot of food producers use the excuse that it's necessary for the preservation of food because they want to put. The yeah, sorry. Um, people, I think a lot of food producers use packaging as, a, as an excuse. Um, they need to, or they want to, be able to put their brand on, the, on what they're producing and there's a good reason for that. They, you know, there's equity in brands and if they want to sell more of the great stuff they're producing, they want to be able to tell everyone yeah. where it came from. The, the supermarkets have taken a lot of that, um, you know, they, with the black box and things like that, they took a lot of that branding away from from growers, so I think they're partly uh, the problem. Um, but it's really, I think it's probably a policy question, so, you know, where does where do the policy makers stand on this and are they ready to make any hard calls on it? Yeah, so it is a really interesting question, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, in terms of, you know, what's, so packaging and plastic generally, is it part of the food waste problem or is it part of solving the food waste problem is a part of the problem, is a part of the solution. And people have different ideas about that. And I guess for a long time it's been thought of part of as part of the way that we would solve the problem. But of course the packaging is partly necessary because we have these incredibly long food supply chains. Right? I mean the packaging kind of goes with the industrial food system that we have, I guess, and these long supply chains that we have and the kind of standardized nature of the way that, you know, that food works its way through the system. So it's kind of evolved with that, if you like. The packaging's evolved with this quite complicated food system that we have. But I think that we're starting to see more and more that the packaging is not necessary to reduce waste. And in fact, perhaps it's part of the waste problem and certainly what they found in the UK and why they're changing their advice to retailers, and I hope it becomes more than advice, and they they actually, um, you know, make it mandatory, is because also we're buying more food than we need because it's in the packaging. We can't just take, you know, the number of potatoes or whatever that we need. We have to take the whole bag. So that's part of the problem, as well. And obviously, we're finding out now that in fact we can store food in different ways. It doesn't require the packaging. So I hope that we're starting to really think more clearly about that and I you know what we see now in Australia in terms of food waste policy is we're seeing some interesting voluntary approaches where certainly federal government and to some extent state government is starting to work with stakeholders all the way through food supply chains 
to get them to look at how, you know, what commitments they can make to reduce their own food waste, to help us reduce our food waste, hopefully at home as well, and to look at packaging. And I guess I hope that eventually we'll go from voluntary approaches like that to mandating what should happen to create an equal playing field where everybody removes the packaging that's not necessary. Joe, do you have an online question? Yeah, someone's just asked, is population growth related to food insecurity and the depletion of resources, such as limited land for agricultural production? Absolutely. So, so those, those numbers I showed you assume certain increases in population going forward, which you know, for many countries is problematic if they don't, if they don't have enough food. So it certainly matters. Um, yeah, it's a delicate conversation in many cases, but it certainly does matter for food security. I mean, yes, I, I think it does matter, but I think that um, we can think about food equity more. And of course, you know, the way that we eat in a country like Australia um, and in many of the rich, you know, um, nations is quite different to the way that people are eating in other parts of the world. So we're kind of using more than our fair share of the resources in a way, that way in terms of land and water, et cetera, and everything else. So in a way, if we, you know, if we change the way that we eat food in the parts of the world where actually we're eating a lot more than we need for our health reasons. In fact, we're eating to excess and that's detrimentally affecting our health. And if we waste a lot less food, then you know, we have capacity to produce more and to feed more people. So it's not quite as simple a relationship as it might initially seem. I think this is, Seneca, you were talking to me before we started the formal proceedings uh, about in India how sort of the standard of living is increasing quite rapidly in India, which is impacting, you know, not just the way people eat, but you were noting that it's also kids are having less exposure to uh, sort of bacteria that keeps them from getting sick and things like that. So I do think it's quite an interesting, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that and sort of the impacts. Um, yeah, you know, things keep changing. Um, we just need to accept those changes and move on, I, I think. Um, because um, uh, before we were having that um, conversation about, you know, how food safety um, aspects can affect with the, the hygienic matters. So if you are more, um, you know, grown up with more hygienic environment, you are more susceptible uh, for um, food safety. Uh, or food poisoning um, issues like that. Uh, but if you are, you know, growing up in an environment, um, you know, you are sort of like a part of the natural environment. Um, and, you know, even if you get some uh, food poisoning problem, maybe your system can still survive and um, your system can uh, fight against uh, those bad pathogenic microorganisms. Um, in case of food poisoning. Uh, but things are changing, I think, um, not only in food security space, but, um, you know, food uh, population, and also the way we work, the way we research. Um, so we just need to, I think, um, acknowledge these things and move on. Hi, I'm Christy. I'm the head of research and development at SPC. So this is really relevant for us. Obviously, we manufacture in Shepparton in the Goulburn Valley with all local produce. And many of you might remember that this time last year, they had extreme floods, which knocked out half of our tomato crops, which was then followed by extreme hail, which damaged our <laughs> apricots, our pears, and our beautiful peaches. At the same time, we have farmers that are pulling out their trees because they're not making enough money. And we're facing import issues with people buying imported tomatoes and fruit from Italy and China and South America or South Africa. What can we do from a policy or tax, import tax policy subsidy um, space to encourage, or consumer space to encourage more consumption of Australian produce and, um, and subsidize our farmers and our agriculture here in Australia? 
Rachel, do you want to take that one? Um, I'll have a go. And again, it's not going to be one thing. I think it's going to be multiple things. But I would say at a starting point, um, people probably people do want to know where their food comes from and it can be quite hard to find that out at the moment so i mean i think if state-based branding about where your food comes from um in terms of you know we can be using taxpayer funds to grow our own local and regional food economies so all the money that government or sorry all the food that government is buying for government related services hospitals schools prisons why aren't we buying food produced by local farmers. We could have procurement policies you know, for that to happen. We can strengthen our local and regional food supply chains. And I guess I'm talking about state-based supply chains here that way. And that's going to be really important, just so we have more resilient um, food systems. But we have really good ways of bringing food you know, from all over the world to where we are, from all over the nation to where we are. We do not have good infrastructure for getting locally produced food to local people. And I actually think we need to work a lot on that. And in terms of policy, if I've got my food minister and I've got my legislated human rights of food, I'm going to throw one more thing in there and say that I'd like a national food plan and a state food plan that looks at these issues. I recall when living in Queensland, they, the coals would would send the mangoes produced in Queensland down to Victoria to be put on a, sh on a truck and shipped back to Queensland. So it <laughs> seems like a pretty silly system, mm. yeah. So, so agricultural production in Australia is a very good question and very hard to unpack quickly, but agricultural, agricultural production in Australia is about a 70 to $80 billion industry every year. Around two thirds of that is exported. It's not, it's not kept locally. And, and, and indeed, they have the right to do that, at least up until now. And in fact, most of the incomes that are received by the animal industry, in fact, is from exports, not locally. Um, sure, we could put a tariff on imports from Italy of tomatoes, because it's a vector for a stink bug that's really a problem for us. I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, 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 I'm with you. But, you know, we'd, we'd be in the, you know, the WTO next week can't just arbitrarily put tariffs on things unless there's a really good reason, and maybe biosecurity is a good reason for doing that. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's talk. <laughs> but, but, you know, it can be difficult for governments to legislate those outcomes. Um, to some extent, too, farmers already do, do, many farmers have significant subsidies already, you have to admit. Certainly in the marine, in the marine capture space, there's significant sub subsidies. But the real problem is you, what you isolated, is it's the floods and fires and storms, um, yeah. We need, to, we need to have some sort of emergency package in place to help farmers recover from that. Or we'll be not only importing milk, but all kinds of other things, because farmers can't produce. Yeah, um, if I just quickly add something, um, Tom, sometimes it's not only these you know, weather events or the, the climate change and things like that, uh, but things like food fraud is becoming you know, really increasing and um, contributing really negatively um, into food security, food safety, and all sort of aspects in the food. Um, you might remember the strawberry needle incident which happened a few years ago here in Australia, which cost um, millions of um, dollars to the Australian uh, strawberry industry because they had to dump all the good um, uh, strawberries uh, because of the strict policies um, and, and the regulations we have. So sometimes they are good, but we need to um, definitely rethink. All right, well, this has gone quite quickly, but it's actually time to wrap things up. Um, so I hope you have enjoyed our, our conversation as much as I have, and please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>